fairest place of all Venice, and I think no place whatsoever, either in Christendom or paganism, may compare with it, is the piazza, the market place of St. Mark. Truly such is the stupendous glory of it, that at my first entrance thereof it did even ravish my senses. For here is the greatest magnificence of architecture to be seen that any place under the sun doth yield. Here you may see all manner of fashions of attire and hear all the languages of Christendom, besides those that are spoken by the barbarous ethnics. This street of St Mark hath two such magnificent rows of buildings on the north and south sides that they drove me into great admiration. The upper part containeth dwelling houses, the lower part the houses of craftsmen that keep their shops there. The lower part is vaulted and adorned with open galleries for the people to walk in, having a great multitude of pillars at the sides. The street which reacheth from the clock to the two huge marble pillars is worthy to be celebrated for that famous concourse and meeting of so many distinct and sundry nations. For you shall see many Polonians, Slavonians, Persians, Grecians, Turks, Jews, Christians of all the famousest regions of Christendom, and each nation distinguished from another by their proper and peculiar habits. A singular show, and by many degrees the worthiest of all the European countries. The palace of the Duke that was built in the year 809 is absolutely the fairest building that I ever saw. It is so situate that in the east it hath a channel running by it. In the west, St Mark's Place. In the north, the Church of St Mark. And in the south, the Adriatic Gulf. It hath been five times consumed with fire, yet so sumptuously re-edified, that it never was so fair as at this present. The gate at the coming in of St Mark's Place hath a wonderful, magnificent frontispiece betwixt marble pillars, which contain no less than thirty foot in height, as I conjecture. Directly over the lintern of the door is advanced the winged lion in alabaster, before whom is portrayed one of their dukes, in his ducal ornaments, kneeling unto the lion. A little above the window there standeth the statue of a religious man, made as far as his middle, with a book in his hand. Above that is advanced the image of Lady Justice, with a naked sword in one hand, and a balance in the other, sitting on lions. The west front of the Duke's palace is adorned with a fair walk, about fourscore and sixteen paces long, and sixteen foot broad. At the edge whereof there is a row of pillars, not very high, but of so great an expanse that I could hardly compass one of them at twice with both my arms. Above this walk is a long gallery, contrived in the front of the palace, having seven and thirty pillars of white marble at the side thereof. But of those there are two made of red marble, betwixt which one of their dukes was beheaded. Above the top of the arch of the gallery there are seven fair glass windows, a pretty way distant asunder, whereof the middle hath two rows of red marble and alabaster pillars that run up to the very top of the frontispiece. Opposite this part of the Duke's palace there is another very sumptuous row of buildings, about some two storeys high, built all with white stone. Under this building is another vaulted walk, about a hundred and six paces long, garnished with two and twenty pillars of white stone. At the very top of the front are images curiously carved in number four and twenty. They are made so large that they answer the full proportion of a man's body. At the farthest end of this part of the piazza there stand two marvellous lofty pillars, 
for the compass of them is so great that I was not able to clasp them with both mine arms at thrice, their diameter in thickness containing very near four foot, as I conjecture. They are said to be made of marble, being all one piece, and were brought by sea from Constantinople, for more than four hundred years since. Upon the top of one of them are advanced the arms of Venice, the winged lion made all of brass, on the other the statue of St Theodorus, standing upon a brazen crocodile, with a spear in one hand and a shield in another. In this distance, betwixt the pillars, condemned men are put to death. For whensoever there is to be an execution, they erect a scaffold there. And after they have beheaded the offenders, for that is most commonly their death, they take it away again. Most memorable in this piazza of St Mark is the Tower of St Mark, made all of brick. It is from the bottom to the top some 280 foot, and being of an equal breadth in every side, namely 40 feet broad. The whole top is covered with pieces of brass, made in the form of tiles that are gilt. On the top of the tower is erected a brazen angel, which is made in that sort that he seemeth to bless the people with his hand. Such is the height of this tower, that in a fair season it is to be seen by sea from Istria and Croatia, which is at the least one hundred miles from Venice. From every side of its square gallery, butting out from the tower, you have the fairest and goodliest prospect that is in all the world. You may see the whole model and form of the city, a sight that doth in my opinion far surpass all the shows under the cope of heaven. There you may behold all their sumptuous palaces, the church of St Mark, with the duke's stately palace adjoining unto it, being one of the principal wonders of the Christian world. Therefore, whatsoever thou art that meanest to see Venice, in any case, forget not to go up to the top of St Mark's Tower before thou comest out of the city. There is adjoined unto this tower a most glorious little room that is very worthy to be spoken of, namely the Legetta, which is a place where the procurators of St Mark's did sit in judgment and discuss matters of controversies. The front of it is garnished with eight curious pillars of marble. On both sides of the door are four statues made in brass, the statue of Mercury with a dead man's skull under his feet, Peace with a burning torch in her hand, wherewith she burneth a helmet, a strange thing to burn steel with fire. Pallas very exquisitely made with a helmet and a feather in the crest, a shield in one hand, a truncheon in another, a mantle about her, and a soldier's coat of mail. And Apollo, like a stripling without a beard, with a horn in one hand, and a quiver full of arrows in another, hanging down about his neck. The fairest street of all Venice, saving St Mark's, is that called the Merceria. This street reacheth from the Rialto Bridge to St Mark's, being of a goodly length. There is a very fair gate at one end of this street, as you enter into St Mark's Place. Two pretty conceits are to be observed, the one at the very top, which is a clock with the images of two wild men by it, made in brass, a witty device and very exactly done. At which clock there fell out a very tragical accident. A certain fellow that had the charge to look at the clock was busy about the bell, but one of those wild men that at the quarters of the hour do strike the bell struck the man in the head with his hammer, giving him such a violent blow, that therewith he fell down dead presently in the place, and never spake more. The other conceit that is to be observed is the picture of the Virgin Mary, made in a certain door above a dial. In the front of this sumptuous gate are presented the twelve celestial signs, 
with the sun, moon and stars most excellently handled. There are in St Mark's Place three very lofty poles, at the top whereof there is a pretty round brazen globe. These poles are of at the least 120 foot high as I suppose. They are infixed on brazen bases which are very curiously carved with images and pretty fine borders. At the south corner of St Mark's there is a very remarkable thing to be observed, a certain porphyry stone almost two yards high and of a pretty large compass. On this stone are laid, for the space of three days and nights, the heads of all such as being traitors to the state. In that place do their heads remain so long though, the smell of them doth breed a very offensive and contagious annoyance. Near to this stone is a marvellous pair of gallows made of alabaster, the pillars being wrought with many curious borders and works, which served for no other purpose but to hang the duke whensoever he shall happen to commit any treason to the state. It is erected before the very gate of his palace, to the end to put him in mind to be faithful and true to his country. If not, he seeth the place of punishment at hand. Also, there is a third thing to be seen in that place, which is very worthy of your observation. The portraitures of four noble gentlemen of Albania, that were brothers, which are made in porphyry stone, with their swords by their sides, and each couple consulting privately together by themselves. Next unto the Duke's palace, the beautiful church of St Mark doth of its own accord offer itself now to be spoken of. The west front, towards St Mark's, is most beautiful, having five partitions, unto which there belong as many brazen doors, whereof the middle, through which they usually go into the church, is made of solid brass, the other four in the form of latticed windows. This front is very stately adorned with beautiful pillars of marble, in all one hundred fourscore and fourteen. Over the top of this middle gate is to be seen four goodly brazen horses made of Corinthian metal, and fully as great as the life. These horses are advanced on certain curious and beautiful pillars of porphyry marble. They yieldeth a marvellous grace to this frontispiece of the church and so greatly they are esteemed by the Venetians, that although they have been offered for them their weight in gold by the king of Spain, yet they will not sell them. Over the gate, as you pass into the body of the church, is to be seen the picture, made most curiously with pieces of marble, as I conceive it, exceedingly little, all gilt over in a kind of work very common in this church, called mosaical work. And so at length I finish this treatise of this incomparable city, this most beautiful queen, this untainted virgin, this paradise, this rich diadem and most flourishing garland of Christendom, the sight whereof hath yieldeth unto me such infinite and unspeakable contentment.